Tonight I've been asked to speak on the subject of good advice or good news, and particularly as it relates to our understanding of the law and the gospel. And I'd like to read Mark's version of Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler. It's found in chapter 10 of Mark's gospel, beginning at verse 17. I was just going to ask you to stand, but I'm not. I'm not at my home church. We always stand for the reading of the gospel, but when we have unbelievers in the mix, I Hey, let's stand for the reading of the gospel, okay? All right. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way and sell whatever you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. We've just heard a story that is repeated in the Gospels of this young man's encounter with Jesus. And the record of that event that you've just heard comes to us in the Word of God, that Word that is inspired by the Holy Ghost, who is the Spirit of truth. And you have heard now the unvarnished truth of this encounter. And it's not here simply for our information, but for our instruction in righteousness and for our edification. So receive it as such. Please be seated. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you are not only there, but that you have spoken, and that you've not only spoken, but that you have spoken clearly and powerfully to us and to our human condition. Grant your mercy this evening by condescending to our frailty our weakness, that we might understand, hear with our ears, and embrace with our hearts the Word that we have just heard. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. The story that I just read is an account of a man who came to Jesus for advice. He was looking for the right counsel. He was asking in one regard what could be considered the ultimate question. And hearing something about Jesus, knowing Him at least by reputation, he sought Jesus out for this advice. And he didn't stroll to where Jesus was teaching, but we are told that he came 
running to Jesus. He came with a sense of urgency. He came as a man on a mission, trying to get the answer to his question as quickly and as clearly as he possibly could. Now, the first question, it's really the fifth question. We already had the test earlier for the other four, and you're on a roll, so let's see if you can get the fifth one, is what question was he trying to get answered? What advice was he seeking from Jesus? Well, we don't have to guess. The Scriptures tell us he ran up to Jesus and he addressed him politely, good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Is there any more important question anyone could ever ask Jesus? What do I need to do to participate in this inheritance that I've heard you speak about or have heard that you did teach? I understand that you talk about this kingdom of heaven and about a legacy that is being stored there for certain people who will have the unspeakable privilege of being heirs of that kingdom of heaven, the principal benefit of being eternal life. And I want to live forever. I'm a wealthy man, Jesus, but I understand that there are certain things that money can't buy. If I knew how I could get in to an inheritance of eternal life, I'd trade every penny I have to do it. If you'll just tell me how, let me know what I need to do to inherit eternal life. Now, if you've ever asked that question, like this man asked this question, understand this, that this young, wealthy ruler came to the right person to get the right answer and the right advice for his situation. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You remember later on in the book of Acts when Paul and Silas are in Philippi and they're imprisoned and the earthquake comes and causes the walls to tumble and create Paul and Silas' freedom and the jailer is terrified by these events, and he comes now trembling to Paul, asking a similar question, what must I do to be saved? And what was the apostle's answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. So knowing that that's the answer that comes later on in the New Testament in the book of Acts from the Apostle Paul, who is an emissary, an ambassador for Christ, wouldn't you expect that when somebody asked basically the same question to Jesus, that he would have given the same answer? This man is eager. Tell me what I need to do to inherit eternal life. I mean, what would you expect Jesus to say? It's easy. Believe on me. Put your trust in me and in me alone, and you will inherit eternal life, you and your household. But for some astonishing reason, that's not the answer that Jesus gave. Jesus had a perfect opportunity here to preach the gospel. He didn't even give him the four spiritual laws. 
In fact, he virtually insulted the man for his gracious greeting. Being, Jesus, being Jewish, Jesus liked to answer a question with a question. You know why my Jewish friends answer questions with questions? Why not answer a question <laughs> with a question? I went through this yesterday at lunch with one of my dear Jewish friends who's here tonight. You want to know why he's here tonight? <laughs> why wouldn't he be here tonight? <laughs> now let's look carefully at how this man addressed Jesus. Because, uh, you know, Jesus listened to what people said. First time I ever heard my mentor, John Gerstner, give a lecture. He was a guest lecturer at the college I attended when I was an undergraduate. He was speaking on predestination. I didn't like it, even a little bit. And I couldn't wait for him to end so that I could challenge him, <clears throat> proving the adage that a fool rushes in where angels fear to tread. But I went up to the professor after this lecture on predestination and asked him a question. And he patiently gave me the answer. And I said, well, that's not what I was asking. And he said, well, if I remember, you said A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Did you not? And I said, well, yes, that's what I said, but that's not what I meant. Well, what did you mean? And so then I said, well, here's what I meant. And I gave him the second round of my question, and he said, young man, there's something you need to learn. And I said, what's that? He said, you need to learn to say what you mean <laughs> and to mean what you say. That was the first lesson I learned from that man, the first of many, many lessons, is I noticed that when people asked him questions, he heard every word that they were asking, and that's what Jesus does here. He's listening carefully, and the man comes up, and he's so excited. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus stops him in his tracks. Wait a minute. Why are you calling me good? Well, you know, I was just trying to be polite. I, I have a great respect for you. Your reputation has preceded you. I hear you're the most uh, wise rabbi in the arena around here. Why wouldn't I call you good? Jesus so said, why do you call me good? Before the discussion goes any further, Jesus challenges the man's understanding of goodness. And before there was any hope of this man hearing and understanding the gospel, Jesus knew that he first had to understand the law. And it was immediately apparent to Jesus that whatever else this young man knew, he had no idea of the law because if he did, he wouldn't run around loosely addressing people as being good. Obviously, this man had not been versed in the Psalms, the Psalms that the Apostle Paul cited in Romans, where he says there is none righteous, no, not one, there's not one who does good. Do you believe that? No, you don't. Nobody believes that. We have such a superficial understanding of goodness, beloved, 
But fundamentally, we're no different than this young man who came up and tried to flatter Jesus by calling him good. Jesus saw through it right away. He said, in this man's exuberance, in his enthusiasm, he had already betrayed. He didn't have a clue about what goodness is. I have a friend in Cincinnati. Every time I see him and I say, hi, Gil, how are you doing? He gives me the same response. Compared to what? <laughs> I said, you know what I mean when I say, how are you doing? I'm just inquiring about your health and how life is treating you at this moment. I don't need a detailed autobiography in response. It's just a, a mere courtesy. I imagine he's compared to what? Because my friend Gil understood that how are you doing is a relative question. Now, I'm not a relativist. He's not a relativist. But there are certain terms that can only be understood as they relate to an objective standard. And the term good is one such term. When I say that somebody is good, I have to add, compared to what? What is, what's your standard of goodness? I have a good dog. Now, what does it mean when I say my dog is good? Here's what it means. She comes when I call her. She's housebroken. And she doesn't bite the mailman on the leg when he comes to the front door. Because what I'm saying is, as far as dogs go, this is a good one. Now, if I say that you are a good person, what am I saying? You come when I call you? <laughs> that you're housebroken? And you don't run around and bite the mailman on the leg? Of course not. I'm using a whole different standard now of goodness when I'm describing human beings than the standard I use when I'm describing canines. But what is the standard for goodness? When God called a nation to Himself, he said to them, you shall be holy as I am holy, that my character is the standard of righteousness. And as long as you have a different standard, you can flatter yourself and think that you're just fine. But the standard of the kingdom of God is not the standard of Mr. What's his name? Mr. Rogers, most famous man in America to come from the town of Latrobe, Pennsylvania, Mr. Fred Rogers. Everybody thinks of Latrobe, they think of Arnold Palmer, but there's so many more people in America know about Mr. Rogers than know about Arnold Palmer, all these little kids. Yeah. Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, everybody's good. What a wonderful day <laughs> in the neighborhood. Huh? And he goes on to say, I'm so glad you've turned out so nicely. <laughs> Everything's cool there. But that's not the standard of righteousness that God gives us. The standard of righteousness is God's own character. Now, who in this room is good compared to that? 
And this is one of the main reasons, beloved, for the very existence of the law of God. In the 16th century, at the time of the Reformation, one of the great dis disputes arose even among the magisterial reformers was, okay, now that the gospel is here, now that we've become redeemed, what is the function, if any, of the Old Testament law? No longer under law, I'm under grace. I don't have the law, I have the gospel. So is there any abiding value of the Old Testament law? Calvin, of course, is noted for his threefold use of the law, which I'll mention more about in a moment, but the first use that Calvin speaks of from the law, which he gets from the New Testament, is that the first function of the law is to be a mirror that reflects to us the character of God. The law reveals the righteousness of God Himself because the law is an expression coming forth from God's own character. Why did the Old Testament psalmist have an affection for the law when he would say, oh, how I love your law. When's the last time you heard a Christian say, oh, how I love your law. And even when the Apostle Paul reju rejoiced in being brought out from under the curse of the law, not being beneath the law anymore, he still would say, the law is holy and never disparaged it because the first function of the law is to reveal the righteous character of God, which is the mirror in which we examine ourselves for the standard of righteousness. And if you've ever looked into that mirror, what did you see? You not only saw the righteousness of God, but instantly your unrighteousness became apparent. We have every imaginable psychological technique to distance ourselves from the guilt of our sin. We are masters at rationalization. We are masters of suppressing our understanding of sin. But if we look once in that mirror of the righteousness of God, if we stare at the law even for a second, it exposes us to the core of our being, and like Isaiah, we cry, woe is me, I am undone. One glimpse of the character of God reveals to me who I am and what I am. And so part of that first use, the Apostle Paul says, is that the law is the schoolmaster who drives us to Christ. Because when the law reveals the holiness of God, at the same time it reveals my unholiness and drives me to the gospel. But that first use of the law had been completely missed by this man looking for advice from Jesus. Calvin says in the opening chapters of his Institutes that it is the, our natural condition to fix our gaze on the terrain of this world, a horizontal vision, a terrestrial view of things. And if we only look at ourselves 
and compare ourselves among ourselves, we can always find people who are more wicked than we are, at least on the surface. And by comparing ourselves among ourselves and judging ourselves by ourselves, which Paul says is not wise, we soon begin to regard ourselves as only something less than demigods. But Calvin said, but if once we raise our gaze to heaven and consider what kind of being God is, like the holy men of the Old Testament, we will begin to tremble And we will say with Job, I abhor myself and I repent. In dust and ashes, we will say with Habakkuk, when Habakkuk sees the revelation of God, he says, my lips quivered. Did you ever see a little child that was on the verge of crying and was trying not to? You watch the lips start to go, begins to quiver, and you know that in any moment now, the tears are going to start gushing out of their eyes. Habakkuk said, my lips quivered, my belly trembled, and rottenness entered into my bones. That's what happens when you look into the mirror of the law of God. I have two men in my congregation at St. Andrews who've told me in recent months how they came to Christ. They had virtually the same story. They said one day they had this overwhelming sense and realization that they were going to hell and they were terrified. And so they ran to the church. And the deepest question was, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Because they understood that something had to happen or they were doomed. How fortunate how blessed these men are to have come to that awakening, to have just a moment have their gaze pointed heavenward, so that for an instant they understood their wretchedness, their helplessness, that they were debtors who couldn't possibly pay their debts. Can you do it? Can you pay God what you owe Him? Be honest for the first time in your life. You know the answer to that question. You are a debtor who's out of money. Your soul is about to be foreclosed on, and you have no ransom to pay. That's the language of the New Testament of our human condition, but we hide our eyes from it. We repress it. We say, God's a loving God. He's not going to send anybody to hell. All you have to do to go to heaven is to die. At least the rich young ruler had the good sense to ask the question, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. Well, the first thing you're going to have to do is disavow yourself of your understanding of goodness. Now, Jesus is unlike what some of the critics say. Some of the critics say, well, see, Jesus didn't consider himself the, the Son of God. Here, Jesus is denying his own righteousness. Oh, come on now. Missing the point. Jesus knew that that young man did not know who he who Jesus was. He called him a good teacher, but he didn't know that he was talking to God incarnate. 
But Jesus knew. He knew nothing about goodness or about righteousness. Why do you call me good? Don't you know that only God is good? All right, now you're there. Put yourself in the young man's shoes. You're hearing this teacher from Nazareth saying to you, don't you know that only God is good? Which is another way of saying, don't you know that you're not? And so now Jesus says, now that we've understood that you don't know anything about goodness, let me give you the gospel. God, who is so good, so loved the world that He has given me to you that if you believe on me, you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. There it is, quick and easy, John 3, 16. Oh, it hadn't been written yet. <laughs> but don't you think now's time for the gospel? Oh, Jesus still has this poor fellow under the law. And now he takes his nose and rubs it in it. He says to him, you want to get to heaven? You know the commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not defraud your brother. Thou shalt not bear false witness. To honor your father and your mother. And there's this huge sigh of relief coming from this young man. Is that all? That's all I have to do to get into heaven? Oh, great, because all of these things I've done since I was a little boy. And what does Jesus say? Apparently, young man, you weren't there when I preached the Sermon on the Mount, where I explained the depth dimension of each of these laws, how that if you've even conceived lust in your heart, you have violated the prohibition against adultery, and if you've been angry at your brother without cause and have held hatred in your heart towards your brother, you have violated the law against murder. I explained all that but you weren't in the audience that day. And so you're walking around now thinking that you've kept all these commandments since you were a child. Jesus might have said to the fellow, you haven't kept these commandments since you got out of your bed this morning. You haven't kept these commandments for the last five minutes. He doesn't do that. The fellow says, I've done all these since I was a little boy. Jesus says, fine, good job. Jesus looked on him and loved him. I, I, if you ever, ever talk about love that is drenched in compassion and mercy, here it is, this fellow had it so wrong. This fellow actually thought that he could live a life that was good enough to give him an inheritance in heaven. Do you know that there are people in this room right now who still think like that? They're more Muslim than they are Christians. They think that if their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, they'll get in. Well, none of you have good deeds good enough to outweigh your bad deeds. Well, if we keep them balanced, nobody makes that. The scales of divine justice are so tilted against you, you've got two chances to make it by your good works, slim and none, <laughs> and slim left tongue. You talk about the most destructive self-delusion there is. 
It is the delusion that you can work your way into the kingdom of God. And Jesus is not nasty to this fellow. He doesn't say to him, you idiot, don't you see what a superficial understanding of the law of God you're working with? No, he loved him. If a human response ever broke the heart of Jesus, it was this fellow's hopeless lostness in his own righteousness. Instead, Jesus used a more indirect manner to explain the truth to the young man. He said, oh, all these commandments have you kept from your youth. Notice the ones that Jesus articulated to him, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. That is what some people call the second table of the law, that portion of the Decalogue that describes our ethical responsibilities to each other, to one another as human beings, where the beginning commandments define our responsibilities towards God. The first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me." And what what God was saying there was not that you can have other gods as long as they don't rank higher than God. You can have your idols, but just make me the number one God. No. When He says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, He means no other gods in my presence. And how far does that presence extend? Infinitely. That means thou shalt have no other gods. Nothing could be more politically incorrect in America than that first law of the Ten Commandments. Because God is an exclusive God. There's only one God, and I am the Lord, there is no other. And your first responsibility as a human being, as one of my creatures, is not to worship any other gods, period. If all we were ever to be judged by was that commandment, folks, we would perish. And then moves on to prohibitions against idolatry. What would happen to you if God judged you just on the basis of this one? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. In the New Testament, when Jesus' disciples asked them, teach us how to pray, the first thing He told them to pray for was what? That the name of God would be regarded as holy. That's the first petition. You live in a culture where the name of God is blasphemed every minute on television and in your churches and in your common speech. Say something like, oh my God, I watch these television programs, remaking a house, people come in, oh my God, oh my God. Oh, my God, blaspheme upon blasphemy upon blasphemy, trivializing the name of the holy, and yet we do it without Him thinking. So you see what He does? Jesus directs the young man's attention to the beginning aspects of the law. And what's the first one? Thou shalt have no other gods before Me. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, look, I know who you are. You worship your money. Instead, He put him to the test. Let's start at number one. You want to get into heaven? Go sell everything that you have, liquidate completely, and give it to the poor, and go take your cross and follow Me. 
If you think that you can get into heaven by obeying the law, when by the works of the law, the apostle tells us, no flesh will be justified. Jesus said, let's try law number one and see how far you get. Jesus is not taking the opportunity here to legislate a universal moral axiom for Christians that they all have to give up all of their private property and give it away. That's not the point. He's dealing with this man, with this man's sin, with this man's besetting sin, with this man's idolatry, where he defines his entire life by his wealth, and that's not good. And so he said, okay, I'll give you inheritance heaven, eternal life. Just keep this first commandment. Sell everything you have. And one of the saddest outcomes of a story in the New Testament is the end of this story. The man came asking for advice from God incarnate, and he couldn't stand the advice that he heard. You see, by preaching the law to this man, Jesus was trying to drive him to the gospel. Instead, he walked away. He wasn't angry. He wasn't spiteful towards Jesus, but the demeanor by which he left was one of sadness. He was sorrowful, shook his head. because he had great possessions. I can't do it. I just can't do it. I won't do it. I'd like to have an inheritance in heaven. I'd like to be saved. This is too much. There are millions of people in this nation who do the same thing every day. When they hear the law, instead of coming to the gospel, they just walk away. They walk away from the law and from the gospel and become men and women without hope because they have a Christless life. And to live without Christ is to be without hope. What a story. And again, it, I know in any group this size, in a gathering in the United States of America at this time in our history, there's got to be not one or two or five or ten. There's got to be 50, 100 people in this room right now who are in that exact position, who all their lives have come near to Jesus and then walk away. If you're one of those people, don't do it again. Look in the mirror. See what the law reveals to you. And let the law drive you to the gospel, which is your only hope in life and in death. Because the gospel is not good advice. 
It's good news. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the gospel. And where You have in Your mercy given us eyes to see, to see the sweetness and the excellence of Christ, our own poverty of righteousness, and yet You have provided for us a righteousness that is not of our own work, but the righteousness of Your Son, which is by faith. I have no righteousness to present to You, and if You require that righteousness be inherent in me before I enter into Your kingdom, O God, I know I will never get there. And so I come with nothing in my hand except the righteousness of Christ. Give to each of us that righteousness. Cover us. Clothe us with it. That His righteousness may become ours. For we ask it in His name. Amen.